getting started here. Uh, this is Embrace Fully. We are a fiscally sponsored program of the Principal Foundation. Uh, that means that we can accept tax deductible contributions because of their nonprofit 501c3 status. Uh, we help returning community members coming out of prison or jail uh, return home and hopefully have as successful of an outcome as possible. Um, and that can include helping them find employment, housing, transportation. And the biggest thing is really helping to provide a sense of community and support uh, as best we can as a group of people. Um, we are focused right now on helping students of Christian science as they come back out of prison or jail. And again, that's because of that um, principal foundation connection. Um, and with that, uh, like I said, I, in the group chat, uh, in the chat, you'll see that there is a link to the conference landing page and a discount code of returning. And during checkout, that's all uppercase. And there's a little link to click that says have a promo code and you click that and then you type that in and that should give you a 30% discount on that. Um, and with that, uh, we will, yeah, we'll be covering a lot of things that are very useful for chaplains, people who are interested in being a chaplain, a visiting chaplain, or a corresponding chaplain, as well as people who are participating in angel teams and helping to welcome people home. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to David, who is, looks like maybe having some issues with his video tonight. Um, he, but, he is, he is. Um, I'm here though. Um, so if everybody can put yourself on mute and um, we'll have a time for some Q&A um, once uh, David's kind of done um, with his interview. So with that, take it away, David. All right. Thanks, Gabriel. Hello, everyone, and a very happy new year to each of you. And um, as many of you know, the work that uh, we do with people coming out of prisons and jails is greatly impacted by the Christian Science chaplains ministering to inmates. And the goal of this ministry work is to aid inmates to first gain their moral freedom in order to gain their spiritual freedom. And we try to do that before they are released. Um, we want to lower recidivism, that's for sure, but helping to spiritualize consciousness is how one begins to thrive as an asset to their community. I can't think of a more important work for Christian scientists to do for themselves and for the world. So uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but there are some 610,000 inmates being released in the United States this year. So I don't know if you can imagine the impact if we could grow the ranks of our volunteers in the prisons. And tonight we have the privilege of talking with George Nutwell, a Christian science practitioner who spent years ministering to inmates in Texas prisons. And if anyone could tell us about the impact of sharing Christian science with inmates, it's George. So, hello, George. Hello, David, and to everyone else that's on the call. Yeah, good to, I, I, uh, I'm so happy to know that you could be here and join us. Sorry you can't see me, but uh, I can see you. So, uh, let's start with this. Why don't you just tell us briefly about your background, um, which if anybody has read the 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 resume here that uh, George has, it's a pretty impressive resume. And I'd just like to know how it may have helped prepare you for the prison ministry work. Well, interestingly enough, I think I mentioned in there that when I was in college at Principia, um, I actually had an opportunity to work with kids in the juvenile center at Pierre, Pierre Marquette. And that was um, a part of a criminology class that I took, I think, in my sophomore sophomore year, I believe. Mm. And um, it's funny that year, many years went by, and I'd sort of almost totally forgotten about that experience. But uh, it's like you never know the little things that uh, happen in our lives that are preparing us for things, you know, off in the future. Yeah. And so that that was a... A, a little experience, but it it definitely, um, I guess it it made me more receptive to that opportunity when it came along many years later. 
But uh, another thing, I guess, about my job was that, um, you know, I was used to being in uh, risky situations and being around people that perhaps were threatening, whether criminals or other types. And, um, you know, if, if you could be at all comfortable, you know, I had some comfort level with those mm. kinds of things. And uh, so initially going into the uh, the jail was not something that I was uncomfortable with. Right. But I, but what I found out was that in a way that, that none of that really mattered because these inmates were so appreciative and so grateful, so respectful to have us there that I... I just, I never felt uh, at any time, um, you know, uh, uneasy or concerned. And, uh, and, and, and even some situations that might have gotten a little bit dicey, the first thing the inmates did was sort of jump to a defensive sort of position and trying to make sure that we were safe and we were taken care of. So... I think one of the myths out there is that, you know, going into the into the jail or prison situation is is dangerous and scary and you're going to be feel threatened. Yeah. And the fact is, these people, they love us. I yeah. mean, when I say us, I mean, chaplains of any religion. Yeah, they really do love having us there. Yeah, I, I remember the first time I went into a federal penitentiary that the scariest thing was the clanking of the doors. And the the guys that we met with were just like you said, they were so protective of that time and that space. It's hard to describe what uh, how sacred that was to them. I, I also noticed here, George, one thing you kind of skipped over. You were a special agent. <laughs> sure, uh, yeah. And I mean, I had opportunities to do uh, investigations and make arrests and Wow. Things like that. So I, I've seen the other side of this, and it was nice to be. I really felt that um, this work offers more opportunity to help those people than in an enforcement position. Yeah. Right. Uh, so I, I really felt like this was a, a much better opportunity where I could do a lot more good. Well, what was it about the prison ministry work that really spoke to your heart, you know, what, what was this work about for you? Well, initially it was a way to serve the Christian science movement. That's really what I was looking for when I uh, found out about it. Mm -hmm. And um, cause I had retired and I was looking to, you know, how can I serve? And um, so I, you know, I found out, within a couple of months of retirement about this program. And, um, and I just thought, well, th that's perfect. I mean, that's, that's really a, a great way to serve. And, um, you know, I went through the training with the prison system. I went through the training with the jail and, uh, the folks, the chaplains at the jail, uh, they called me up. I think it was the day after training and they're like, so when do you want to start? <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, when can I start? And they're like, you could start tomorrow if you like. <laughs> wow. And so it, it just started immediately. And then I was, I was coming in for three, four hours a day for like three days a week right. or early on. And then later on, it kind of shifted to two days a week, still that sort of three to four hours a day time frame. But, but I think what spoke to my heart was um, I really felt like the apostles in the early days, you know, really going out and meeting people and talking to them and um, offering them the truth, the gospel, yeah. and um, and and they're re they're receptive, you know, they they wanted they wanted it, hmm. and um, and so I, I really felt like that was an opportunity. We don't have many of those opportunities uh, 
within our uh, church movement. But this is one of those where you really feel like you're going in, you know, amongst the, these people and and sharing and um, and you know having this this great opportunity to to see how it blesses them and of course how it blesses us too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what were some of the biggest aha moments or learning that you experienced? Maybe something that you didn't expect when you started in the ministry work? Um, well, one of them uh, is related to how Christian scientists really need to um, study their Bible and get up to speed on their Bible. Why is and that? What I quickly realized was that was the primary reference point for everyone in there. Um, and uh, and so if I was going to be able to share Christian science, I had to do it through the Bible. And uh, I, I quickly learned that. And I started doing research through the Bible and looking at how can I explain Christian science by using the Bible? And I just started digging through it. Mm -hmm. and um, And I would find things things that I'd never noticed before, or maybe things that I just never found before that so clearly explained Christian science. And, and that, that's how I would initiate a lot of the conversations and discussions was, was starting with the Bible. Wow. Well, that's usually what people of other faiths do. So that's amazing that you did that. I always found it interesting too, how much more knowledgeable uh, inmates were about the Bible than I was. Uh, I mean, they they knew stuff that I, I was kind of just like, like you said, kind of trying to catch up. So <laughs> that that well, and, was and fascinating. From, and from time to time, they pointed things out to me or alerted me to certain things. Or, um, you know, in some cases, I, I ran into people who had been in seminaries and had studied and had a quite a strong background and. And often in our talks and discussions, they would bring in, you know, some ideas or how, you know, certain stories could relate to a, a spiritual teaching that we were working on. And, and so I was learning from them and they were learning from me and we're all learning together uh, about Christian science, but we were doing it through the Bible. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um how did you get along with uh, chaplains of other faiths? And what challenges did you face being a Christian scientist? Well, that that is an interesting question because that has a lot to do with how my chaplain experience began. The first day I get called into the chaplain's office and I thought, okay, this is just a get to get to know you one, uh, one another kind of meetings. Mm -hmm. But what it turned out to be was, um, I think there were two or three of them uh, and me, and it it was, it really turned into them wanting to save me from the cult of Christian Science, and so that went on for about I'd have to say nearly three hours. The first day I didn't actually go and talk to any inmates, because I spent the whole time talking to the chaplains. Um, but what that did was it really got me motivated to go home and start studying the Bible. And, and that is what motivated me to, to have that idea of, okay, how can I explain Christian science using script, the scriptures? Mm -hmm. And so they, you know, I guess to, it could have seemed a little bit like I was, you know, being ganged up on. <laughs> Interrogated, really, I would think. But what really what I came away with as I was driving home that day was I need to get, you know, I need to get up to speed a whole lot better for this. You know, I need to go in there prepared and yeah. um, ready to explain Christian science, you know, with the Bible. And, yeah. and it really, um, and I think it also really pointed me even more to to Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount and, you know, those teachings that are 
you know, we're really an update to the Old Testament. Mm. And, you know, a lot of times, a lot of the things you get hit with are things that are in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. But it's Jesus' teachings in the Sermon on the Mount that I that I really considered to be that was the update. That was the New Testament. Right. So while I, I did spend a lot of time in the Old Testament, I really dug in deeply uh, in the New Testament. And so to finish the story about the chaplain, so, um, so did I they know, save uh, you. Pardon? Did they save you? Uh, well, since we're already saved, you know, <laughs> it 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 wasn't really necessary. But okay. anyway, um, a couple things happened um, when I came out of there. Was I learned that I could only speak to certain people that were on a list that was a list of people who had said they were Christians and that caused their names to basically be fed into a list that said Christian science. And so for the first, um, I guess about nine months, I could only talk to people on those lists, on that list. And, and that's okay. I did that. And, and I couldn't, give out i could give out science and health but i couldn't just hand out sentinels or monitors and things like that and so it was somewhat limited but that's okay because i kind of needed to get started myself and um so it, it worked out just fine but that summer i started in october that summer a new sheriff came in and he got rid of the contract that those chaplains were operating under and so one day, all of a sudden, there were no more chaplains, except for two people who um, were sort of lower in the totem pole, and they were on a personal service contract. And so they stayed. But what happened was all those controls, all those rules about what I could do and what I could not do, that just disappeared. And so the next day I walk in and it was like, wow, well, you can do whatever you want to do. So I talked to anybody, went anywhere, shared anything. And so that was the end of those restrictions. And, um, and then so to take it a couple of years down the road, I come in one day and the one chaplain who was on that personal service contract, who sat in with that uh, original meeting or sat in in that original meeting he comes up to me and says man I want to apologize for that first day mm. he said I'm so happy you're here you, mm -hmm. you, it's so good to have you here and I just want to tell you I love you man and wow. we had a big bear hug wow. and and so that's kind of how it all concluded and and so that initial you know, resistance just, you know, melted away. Yeah. And it, it just became a very good relationship between me and the official chaplains. And then there were all these other, you know, religions. They had their chaplains too, but, you sure. know, we all got along. It was, it was, it was great. There was nothing I couldn't do, nothing I couldn't say, nowhere I couldn't go. Wow. That's amazing. That's a great story. How did you work with uh, those inmates who may have opposed your theological views as a Christian scientist? Well, any, any stories speaking, about that? Honestly speaking, there weren't that many. And it, what happened more so is that there might be people that I was talking to, and I might go back to see them another time. And in between me being there and coming back, some other chaplain or minister would come in and talk to them and they would tell him about Christian science. And he'd say, Oh, well, that's just a cult. That's not. And he'd go through this whole list of things. And so I come in the next week and they'd start off with that. And I, I realized the very first time, the best thing I could do was to pull out or open up to the six tenets in science and health. And so I, I took my science and health and I passed it around to all the people who were asking that question. And I said, read this and tell me if you think there's something on there 
that you don't believe in or you don't agree with or that's not Christian. Hmm. And every single time they'd hand it back and say, well, that's pretty much what we believe. Well, and I said, well, that's Christian science. So I don't know what those other folks are talking about, but this is what we believe. And if you think that that's similar to what you believe, then, you know, then we're good. And that was the end of it. Wow, that's great. Um, well, as you know, the prison ministry work, especially with inmates who are new to Christian science, is mostly about preparing the moral soil uh, so that the seedlings of truth have a chance to spring up and grow and therefore change lives. What can you tell us about how you worked with inmates to aid their moral transformation? Well, you know, we spent a lot of time on the Sermon on the Mount and a lot of time on love. And love has a way of clearing the air, of sort of opening up their receptivity. And, and it, it, it sort of helped them to start thinking about, okay, well, first I got to I got to love people. Well, if you're going to love people, you're not going to rob them. You're not going to cuss at them. You're not going to fight with them. Yeah. You know, and and so that was when when they saw that that was really how a Christian or a child of God uh, lives and acts and thinks. Well, that affects everything. And so the you know, the. Um, the two greatest commandments, which are a summary of the Ten Commandments, are to love God and love your fellow man. Well, if you get those two things right, all the other commandments are covered. Yeah. And so that's really how we approach that. And, and so then these sort of these moral questions, you know, they were they were kind of answering them themselves. Yeah. And and so as what I would see is that as they I would see their um, character change, mm -hmm. and I had some people who started off saying, you know, I hate people, and and that's just who I am, mm -hmm. and that's the way it is. And I get into fights, and you know, I want to hurt people, and I I want to argue, and and I saw a couple, I saw several people like that, that over a period of time, they said to me. You know, I never thought that I could become a kind and compassionate and loving person. I really didn't think I could. Wow. But they, I saw it myself. I saw them interacting with the other inmates, you know, and they're telling me about different things that they were experiencing with people that they'd never experienced before. Wow. And so, you know, it was, it was a real time thing that I could watch and uh, I could see others talking others would talk about them and say oh. yeah this guy is not the way he used to be he's really? he's really kind and loving and compassionate and meek and humble and you know all these christly qualities and so those qualities they really destroy all that whatever that immorality or sin is that you can't you can't be like that and have those christly qualities at the same time yeah Especially if you're sincere. I mean, uh, my my next question was just, you just answered it. I, I was really wanted you to talk about what evidence you uh, were looking for in an inmate's behavior that would indicate whether a moral transformation had taken place or not. But uh, it, I mean, it sounds like not only were was it taking place, but it was taking place in front of the other inmates who could really say, wow, that guy's changed. That guy's different. Well, and I can add to that. Another thing is, is fear. Okay. That fear is a way to tell how materialistic someone's thinking is. Good point. Because if, if you're afraid of a lot of things, um, it means that you're still really deep in the material world that, I mean, that's, you really believe in it. Yeah. And the less people are fearful you can start to see they're starting to let go of matter. Yeah. And so, yeah, there are those ways that you can, you can see how people's thinking is changing, how their character is changing. Yeah. 
Wow. Well, you know, it just it kind of brings up the whole idea here of the the value of inmates learning self examination. Um, that it, 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 what did you do to encourage inmates to 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 examine the contents of their own heart? That's a lot of work. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's Mrs. Eddy talks about Jesus aiding transformation. Well, you know, um, I don't know that I specifically used those words or, or told them they needed to do that, but I feel that they um, wanted to share their experiences and things such as, well, you know, this guy, you know, he wanted to start something with me, and 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 I, I said no, uh, that's not who I am. I'm not going to engage in that. I'm not going to react to that. And, you know, they'd be telling these stories kind of like testimonies. Mm. And, you know, and I'm watching the room and I've seen other people and how they're reacting. And, you know, I think if somebody was just making it up, other people would be like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> you know, but I never got that feeling. I, I always got the feeling they were testifying to to real changes, and they were uh, they were proud, they were uh, happy, they were grateful that they be they've been able to act differently than they had before. You know, in the all these interactions that they're having all the time, you know, in in jail or in prison, there there's constant opportunities for them to be tested sure. about their growth. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, how how important is it to be completely honest and truthful uh, regarding an inmate's hidden motives or false intentions, maybe, you know, where maybe an, an inmate is unconscious of the fact that their motives and intentions are more like a, a, a wolf in sheep's clothing? Well, what, what, in other uh, words, let me, let, me, let me just ask one more. What, what do you what do you think of volunteer risk by being completely honest and covering hidden motives that you know what 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 would be the risk there and what's what do you gain by being completely honest? Oh I, I think there's no risk to it. The risk is is not being honest. And um and so you know one of the things related to that I learned was that you know we've got to stay in our spiritual lane. And uh you know, a lot of the inmates are are kind of testing us. They're looking for us to to do them favors, or you know, maybe contact somebody on the outside. Or uh, I mean, there's a long list of things when you go through the training that you're not supposed to do. Yeah. And and when they're bringing stuff up like that, it's important to quickly address it and say, you know, that's we can't do that. That's not right. Yeah. And 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 call them out on that call them out on that and say, look, you know, I'm here to spiritually support you. Yeah. So I, I, I don't get into that other stuff. That's not what we're here for. And of course that sets a tone because if you were to see them later on, on the outside, mm. they already know where you stand on that. Yeah. And that it's, it's the same when you get out, you know, you have a spiritual lane that you stay in and you're not getting into any of that other stuff. And um, so, yeah, if you don't set those ground rules early on, um, you know, they're going to they're going to try to push, you know, and, and try to maybe get away with things. But, you know, it's it's also important that you have to be discerning with these people. You have to discern, you know, that they're not always going to tell you what they want to do or what their motives are. And you have to be somewhat discerning and see some of those things I talked about, you know, how are they expressing themselves? Are you seeing more Christ-like um, qualities in their behavior and the things they say and do? Um, and uh, as I mentioned, fear, it's another one. It's a little thing, but uh, when someone's very fearful, it kind of tells you that, well, maybe, maybe they're not, um they're they're not all in on on this truth as they maybe are pretending to be yeah that's that's a really excellent point though um and as you know too that you're, you're working with people that are in various phases of prison life and 
And one of them is, is the, you know, is the pre-parole, you know, like they haven't yet to go before a parole hearing board or they have gone before and failed and are still in prison. But what, what specifically do you do to help inmates prepare for their parole hearings? Um, you know, it wasn't necessarily for me, it wasn't parole because since I was in the jail, it was about okay. going to court, you know, where they're going to be found, you know, guilty or not guilty, or maybe the charges be thrown out, or maybe they're given a lesser sentence or or whatever. Same kind of situation where they've got to go to court. And um I I learned a lot about um helping them to prepare. And um, one of the things, uh, and, and there's a couple of things I'm going to mention, but one of the things early on was to tell them that when they go in there, they need to remember and see themselves as the child of God, that they're innocent, they're innocent, they're God's child. And then to see the judge and the prosecutors and the defense attorneys and jury or whoever's in there that yeah. they're all the children of God. Yeah. And it was interesting because one day I was telling this guy this as he prepared. He said, you know, let me tell you something. He said, I once had a defense attorney some years ago who told me the same thing. And I thought to myself, I wonder if he was a Christian scientist. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but another thing was uh, telling them and helping them to understand that they needed to put God in control of that process. Yeah. And um, I had two very specific cases where um, the first guy, um, one day I went in and we had sit around the picnic table in the cell and um, he brought up the issue about having to prepare for um, going to court the next week. And he said, look, I've been arrested like seven or eight times for drugs. Mm. He said, it doesn't look good for me. Mm. No, and I can't imagine that they're uh, they're not going to give me some really hard sentence. Yeah. And I said, well, I said, they're not the deciders of this. The prosecutor, your attorney, the jury, the judge, none of them. God is in charge of your life and 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 how these things all you know get resolved i said god's in charge and if you want justice true justice you've got to put it in the hands of god yeah and so you know we well, obviously we talked about a lot more than that but so the next week i come back hmm. and and he comes running you know from his bunk and everybody else comes and they come up to me and he says, hey, I can tell you this story. He said, I went to court. He said, I, I decided after you talked to me that I was going to put it in God's hands. I wasn't going to worry about any of the legal questions or issues or any of that stuff. And I just went in there thinking God's in control of this situation. Mm -hmm. And so he says that at the beginning, the prosecutor and the judge um, have like a a conferencing that's going on. And then the judge basically says, and he said, there's lots of people in the courtroom, says, you know, the prosecutor and I have talked about this and we've decided, and I can't tell you why, all I can tell you is that it feels like the right thing. Hmm. And we've decided that, uh, we're going to send you to a treatment program hmm. and you'll, you'll not, you'll not have to do any more time. Hmm. And, and he, he said, everybody in the courtroom is just like, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> because the judge and the prosecutor really looked like this was a decision not made, made by them. Yeah. But just a decision they had to accept. Yeah. So he's telling everybody in this whole cell and they're all like, wow. And so a couple, maybe like a year or two later, I've got another guy and it wasn't a drug issue. It was assault and weapons and all kinds of stuff. And he was actually a veteran. And um, 
it's almost exactly the same thing what happened. Mm. And he gets up in front of the whole cell block and is telling the whole story. And, and he's just saying, guys, you got to put God in charge. You know, this is up to God. This is not up to us. It's not up to the judge. It's not up to the defense attorney. This, this is a God thing. And so, I mean, these guys ended up with their testimonies, you know, that that's better than anything I could have said. Yeah. And so that those same principles, I think you can apply those to whether it's court or parole hearing or, you know, whatever it is. Yeah, that's that, that's wonderful. I mean, just the fact that people are, you know, I hate to say the word vulnerable, but allowing themselves to be in a sense vulnerable, which is not a good thing in prison. Uh, but to allow something outside of yourself to be in charge is a that's a big deal. What you just said to me that it's a that's a really pretty big deal. Um, can you can you describe any any healings that you think were just you know something you you really want to you could talk about that um, that the guys you work with experience? Sure. Well, you know um, I've written about some of them in the periodicals but there's one that uh is not in the periodicals and it's actually my favorite one. Oh, do that one and um so i i had um but let me the backstory is i went to a particular cell because there was a family member of some christian scientists and they had sort of contacted me and say could you go talk to you know this family member and so that led me to a particular cell and that that person ended up being very helpful in, in, in bringing others in the cell to come listen and participate in our, our, our meetings and our talks. And through one of those, it led me to a guy who wanted to kill himself. But after one of our things, he decided not to kill himself. <laughs> and then that guy uh, working with him, he ended up uh, having to go down to the medical unit. And because I went down to see him and it was something, his thing got resolved, but that enabled me to, to meet another guy. And so it's like, you can see this, this chain that was like a divine chain of one guy to another guy to another guy. And so I get to this, um, this um, unit or room in the medical unit and um and so there's a guy in there who couldn't talk. He had a um, tracheotomy tube in his throat. Oh, yeah. Um, but he came to every, um, and this was weekly, and I'd be there for, <clears throat> let's say, uh, an hour to two hours in that, in that room. And uh, he always came up and listened he couldn't speak but you could tell he was taking it in and and this is over about three or four months every week and we would talk about the bible lesson but we'd go off and and be talking about you know very sort of main principles of christian science again using the bible to help explain them but particularly about, you know, healing. And, um, and so this guy got a copy of Science and Health. He already had a Bible. He got the monitor every week that I would bring. He got Sentinels that I would bring. And, and uh, so he had a stack by his bed of all this stuff. And, um, and so one day I go into that room the next, you know, the, the following week. And he's not there, but everybody else in there, and there's about six or seven guys, they all come running up to me and they're like, boy, do we have a story for you? <laughs> and I said, okay. And that's kind of like how a lot of these things ha start happening, you know, how they would, you know, as soon as I walk in and they say, remember so-and-so, and I didn't even know what his name was. His name was Reggie. He said, Reggie, um, we didn't really know much, much about him because he couldn't talk. But a couple days ago, he had to go to this medical appointment 
outside the jail at a hospital or a doctor's office. And so he went and then he came back and he didn't have his tracheotomy tube anymore. And he started talking to us and he started explaining what happened. And what had happened was he had been only given six months to live. He had throat cancer. And so he had gone that day to that uh, appointment and the doctor, you know, whether it was a x-ray or, uh, you know, whatever they used to determine what, what, how the cancer was doing, the doctor said, your cancer's all gone. Mm. And so there's no cancer in his throat. So they took the tube out, they sewed up his, you know, his neck and sent him back. Mm -hmm. And so he shows up and he's telling everybody the story and the nurse, he's telling the nurses, he's telling the doctors, he's telling everybody. So the whole medical unit, which was, you know, probably a couple hundred people in different rooms, you know, they're all hearing this about this. Mm -hmm. And he told them, he said, God healed me. Mm -hmm. And um, the next day, his the charges were dropped and he was released and he went home. Wow. And so I asked the guys, I said, well, there's anything you can tell me about like his daily practice? And they're like, all we can say is he read these materials. But what was uh, memorable was they said every day, he got down on his knees on the hard, cold, concrete floor and prayed to God. Mm -hmm. And so I think the thing that stuck with me about that is just the, the humility yeah. that he was just expressing an incredible humility. And, you know, I guess we'll never know the exact details you know, what he was thinking or what he was saying or any of that. But the bottom line was the cancer was healed. Yeah. And he was released. Wow. Well, talk about a transformation. That, that story stayed at in the medical unit for at least a year. There were people still talking about it a year later. That's amazing. That's a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're getting kind of late here in our time, but uh, I just wanted to ask you, uh, there may be people that are on the call, maybe sitting on the fence about the prison ministry work. And what could you tell them, um, like you just did, that might nudge them towards getting involved? And how might the prison ministry work impact their lives and their spiritual development? Well, uh, you know, at a minimum, you're <laughs> going to grow. And and I grew so much in my understanding of Christian science, of the Bible, um, of, to learning about other people. And, and, you know, I called it my laboratory. Yeah. You know, it was my laboratory because I could see how these spiritual laws and spiritual principles, when followed and when practiced, would lead to healing and transformation. So it educated me so much in terms of what Christian science is all about. But I will add to that, that, um, you know, people are concerned about, well, there's not enough people in the pews at church, or, you know, the membership numbers aren't, you know, what they used to be. And, you know, thinking, well, what, you know, what's happening to Christian science? Well, the prison ministry is one of these areas where Christian science is growing. And in the state of Texas, there's somewhere in the five to 600 number range of inmates that are reading the Bible lesson every week. And I can tell you from my experience, one Bible lesson is probably read by 20 or 25 people. So all you do the multiplication, you do the math, and you can see how many people are being exposed to Christian science in the in the prison system. Hmm. Now, does that mean they're going to be all become Christian scientists? No, but that's not why we're there anyway. We're not there to proselytize. 
We're there to share the truth of Christian science. And we're there to help awaken and enlighten people. And they'll take it with them. I mean, sometimes they take it to their church or they take it to their family. But but it's a leavening effect. It's leavening consciousness. And so that's that is one of the places I know. I mean, we also know it's you know, Christian science has been growing in Africa and other developing parts of the world. But here in the United States, it's growing in the prison system. So I I I think every Christian scientist would want to be a part of that and and feel like they're they're helping the movement, just like in the olden days, when I say the olden days, the early workers, you know, they were going to a new town or a new city in the United States and they were healing people and it was growing and churches were opening. Well, that same thing is happening, but it's happening in, in the prison system. And so if you want to be involved in that, that that's where you go. <laughs> and, um, and like I said at the very beginning, there's no need to be afraid because these people will love you like no one's ever loved you before. <laughs> it's very impersonal, but they just appreciate the truth and the love and the fact that you're there, you're volunteering your time, they understand that and they deeply appreciate it. Well, that's really great. That's a great message there for all of us. Um, let's uh, turn it over to the audience here. If anybody's got a question for George, raise your hand or just start talking. I saw Karen. Karen had a question. Why don't you go ahead, Karen? Oh, unmute. <clears throat> there you go. Um, I just wondered if you I had can. some. Um, I put it in the chat too. Uh, of some things that you are just you find yourself going to a lot in the Bible to get that conversation started. You have some favorite things that, like, I always start with Genesis, <laughs> Genesis one, or in something like that. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, I think Genesis, you know, because that opens up the whole issue about, you know, Adam and Eve, because that's where scholastic theology begins. And uh, scholastic theology is really the biggest opponent to Christian science. And so that, you know, that's definitely something that um, helps to work on. Um you know, there, there's a lot of things. Uh, one of my favorites is actually Isaiah 11. Um, and I don't have my Bible in front of me. But if you go to Isaiah 11, it talks about um, the, uh, the spirit of the Lord um, is understanding and wisdom and knowledge and fear of the Lord, right? It starts out with that. Uh, and of course, I would explain as a lot of people would talk about the Holy Spirit. And I'd say, well, that right there just to find what the Holy Spirit is. But then the next thing it goes on, it talks, of, you know, it's prophesying about Jesus and the coming of Jesus and the Messiah. And it talks about that he will not use his eyes to see or his ears to hear. And that opens up the conversation about the five senses. You know, because a big part of Christian science is, you know, we don't um, we don't follow what the five senses are telling us. You know, it's it's what God is telling us, what spirit is telling us, what we use our spiritual senses. And so I love that because it just opened up some good conversation. Uh, and then, the, I mean, obviously, my my favorite go to whether it be in prison, whether it be as a practitioner, whether it's anything, is the Sermon on the Mount. And um, because particularly, uh, there would always be people of different religions. And so one thing is a little different from the jail and the prison ministry. In the prison ministry, you've got people coming because they want to come to a Christian science service. But I was going into their cell and there were no Christian scientists. And so there are people of different religions and backgrounds. I had atheists. I had 
Satanists, I had Muslims, Jews, you know, you name it, everything. The one thing that everybody could agree on was love. And so, because sometimes they'll get into debates and you have to like settle them down and like, okay, yeah, this, we're not going to get into a theological debate in here. That's not what we're here for. But I would always jump back to love. And it didn't matter what they believed in or where they came from. Love is something that everyone understands, everyone appreciates. And so we would talk about, you know, how Jesus expressed and how he taught love and forgiveness and mercy and meekness. And, and that was something that everybody would listen to and be receptive to. And, and, and that's, I mean, healing starts with that. Mrs. Eddy said that if you only read the Sermon on the Mount every Sunday, that would be enough for Christian practice. And so it is the foundation of Christian science. So it's a good place to start. Could I make a comment? Sure. Is that Janet? Hi, Janet. Hi. <laughs> yeah, we uh, always used to look at Mrs. Eddy's hymns, too. And we had one guy, we uh, had a discussion, uh, Feed the Hungry, Heal the Heart. And how we were talking about that was metaphoric. But um, he said, well, could you look at that literally? We said, well, of course. And he was supposed to have heart surgery. And, and he had been attending for about three or four years at that time. He went in and they told him he didn't need the heart surgery anymore. And so it was just beautiful to see how powerful that those ideas from Mississippi's hymn were. And then uh, another thing that we always, they would always say, you know, things from the Old Testament. And I would always uh, remind them that Jesus often said, you've heard it been said, and would quote something in the Old Testament. And then what he said in the New Testament, which was many times the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, not that there weren't wonderful things in the Old Testament, you know, that were very, very good. But sometimes he would say, no, it, that's not it. And then the other thing that um, we would often bring up is that no matter what challenge you're going through, uh, there's probably somebody in the Bible who's gone through a challenge very similar to that. So you can find that particular uh, passage and it will inspire you. I'll shut up now. <laughs> Well, no, that's good. I mean, Mrs. Eddie's hymns has a lot of Bible verses in it, so they could relate to that. Oh, yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah we've had some we had some funny conversations about, you know, all the people in the Bible who at some point in time had committed some kind of crime. And, uh, you know, and I, I mean, I had murderers. And, and so we talk about Moses, you know, murdering the Egyptian. And um, and then we talk about Paul. And you're like, you know, what's worse than killing Christians? That's like, I, I was like, there's nobody in here that's done things as bad as Paul has done, as Paul did. And Paul could transform and he could change. And so, yeah, the, those Bible characters, you know, they, they could relate to a lot of them. Well, the other thing our people really loved was we would share with them where Mrs. Seti says, man has a noble destiny. And they were just very blown away with that yeah, yeah i think uh, christian science particularly that the idea that we spend a lot of time talking and thinking about man as the image of god mm -hmm. and 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 that is like one of the early things that they say is so different about a christian science chaplain is that we tell them that they're innocent and they're the child of God and God loves them. And no, the other churches are not telling them that stuff. You know, it's all about you're a sinner and you're going to go to hell and all this stuff. And it's funny that um, the uh, the stars, I know you would appreciate this, Janet, but I, so I worked in the Stars and Stripes unit and that was my favorite place. They were military veterans. Right. And um, they... Um, I mean, they they were all very receptive, and and we we had a lot of good things that happened in there. Um, but um, that that idea um, that Christian Science was about lifting them up, 
and raising them up. And so one day I was asking um, one of the guys who's kind of the leaders of this, he was a Vietnam veteran. So they, they made, they put him in charge of the unit because he was the senior guy. And um, one day we were having a conversation, kind of a side conversation about, you know, um, the schedule and time and stuff. And I said, well, you know, are, are there a lot of other ministers that come in here? And he said, well, there used to be, but we told them we didn't want them anymore. We just wanted Christian science to come in here. <laughs> and he said, the reason was they kept telling us that we're going to hell. <laughs> but he said, I have a daughter. They kept saying that women can't be ministers and all this stuff. And these guys are like, we don't want to hear that stuff. <laughs> You know, and so, uh, you know, totally unbeknownst to me, they had decided that they were only going to have a Christian science uh, chaplain. Uh, and, and so, I mean, that just shows what we have to offer them and others. I have a quick uh, question. <laughs> sure. Um, you had talked about um, the... Um, knowing the Bible. And I found when I first started going in that, that the guys all knew the story of Job. Mm. And I didn't know the story of Job as a, as a lifelong Christian scientist. We never had a lot of it in the lesson. Mm. And I had to go home and read the story of Job and really do some research on that because it, it resonated with them because everything was taken away from Job. <laughs> So um, I just wondered if you ran across the story of Job at all. With I had that same experience as you. That, um, I mean, obviously I'd read it, but I hadn't put much time into it. And so once that started coming up, I was like, you know, I got to go back and study the book of Job. And, uh, and so as it turned out, I ended up later on spending a lot of time on that, on Job. Because it did, they did relate to it. It did have a lot of meaning for them, and and that that opened up a lot of good conversations and a lot of good, you know, opportunities for you know growing for all of us. In uh, my time at Boston University School of Theology and Stanford, uh, I did a master's in religious studies there, and I did papers on the Book of Job, and in it I talked about how Mrs. Setti had provided Job, uh, provided what Job wished for. He kept saying, if I could only get a, a hearing before God. And he kept saying he was innocent. And um, all of those instructors wanted to get a science and health. And they read that and they said, I think you're absolutely right. I think Mrs. Setti provided uh -huh. that, um, the type of thing that they he was wishing for. The, the trial. Well, and I think for chaplain, the Christian science chaplains, you know, Mrs. Eddy explains a lot of things in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And and those explanations, uh, people really like. Yeah. I mean, they really feel like that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And they'd never heard it before. Yeah. And so that's, I mean, that's another great thing you offer is, is that... Um, that higher understanding of things in the Bible, you know, from the glossary. And, and then another thing I learned was, you know, Mrs. Eddy doesn't explain everything in the Bible, but she gives us uh, basically the tools so that you can go into the Bible. And there's things that she didn't explain, but if you utilize um, these spiritual principles that we've learned in Christian science, you can use those to kind of help open up, whether it be a story or a scripture, and and sort of we have we have the tools as Christian scientists, and and so um, you know the book of you know her chapter on Genesis and the apocalypse it kind of teaches us how to do that um, in other parts of the Bible that she hasn't addressed it, you know, in her writings. Hey, Bonnie, you're muted. There we go. Um, when I, with the men that I've worked with, um, they wanted to really learn how to pray. And did you find that? Um, and I, and I had to get them to slow down. I, I said, this is your conversation with God. I, I finally 
tried to make it more personal for them. But, um, and then it ended up that I finally said, do you want to hear how I pray at night when I say the Lord's Prayer? And I went through an example of where my thought goes mm -hmm. through that Lord's Prayer and what it means to me. And they were, it was so meaningful for them to learn the Lord's Prayer with the spiritual interpretation. Mm -hmm. And I had to keep slowing them down because I want to go racing through it, which is what all, it's just a ritual and it's not okay. a ritual. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I wanted to know if you had any comments about that. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, there would be different things where they would say, well, can can you help me come up with a prayer about this particular thing? Mm -hmm. and, and again, I would just use those tools, which I think Mrs. Eddie gave us, you know, for for any particular thing. You know, we have a way that we approach the Bible and it helps us to understand it and pull out, you know, what's below the surface. Right. And um, and also maybe to simplify, you know, some things. And so, yeah, I, I would do that on occasion. Um, the big one was, um, and I, I've wrote, it's come up in my work in the periodicals about the, the man who, wanted to um pray to to uh um, forgive his enemies mm. and so we um we spent a lot of time talking about well you know how, how he said how can i how do i pray for my enemies yeah how do i do that and so you know we talked about the idea of um knowing what was true about them and you know affirming that they were the children of God, that God loved them. And, 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 you know, sometimes prayer, there's kind of a question, not a question, but a request. And so we talked about the idea of, of praying that, that your enemies would feel God's love and that they would uh, grow in understanding and that, you know, and, and it's, it's simple, but, you know, it worked for them. And, um, and so there were times that, yeah, that that came up and they want to they want to have some ideas about how to pray and and again i think christian scientists offer a lot in that in that regard well you know the one thing i realized and i gave a very brief testimony about it was that in christian science we have learned how to pray and and most people don't know that <laughs> and so the prisoners were hungry for it because they wanted to develop that relationship. And um, and I love forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Love is reflected in love. And we and I talked a lot about about forgiving. And it's not always easy, but when you yeah. do it, <laughs> yeah. when you do it with love, it frees you up tremendously. Right. Yeah. Love loves is the answer no matter what the question is love is the answer yeah. mm -hmm. and they feel that too i mean yes. they, that that gets them going it really makes them feel you know if, if we were going to talk about sort of a spiritually uplifting moment i mean once you start talking about love it just changes the mood it brings peace right you know, to that environment it's good right One thing that uh, I brought up, even when I was a military chaplain, was then that people just would eat up. Is the idea that the Bible says two hundred and ten times, "Fear not" or "Don't be afraid." And that that's oh, that's the big one, right? Yeah, and it's like, well, if it's if they say it in the Bible that many times, yeah. it must be really important. <laughs> and that's, that's, God, <laughs> that's God speaking directly to us saying, be not afraid. And of course, Mrs. Eddy, you know, says that's an important part of Christian science. So that, that was another thing, yeah, that it came up a lot. And it was an important thing that we spent time on that. Marilyn. Uh, yes, I have a question about the the wonderful logic of starting with describing Genesis and God made man in his image and likeness, male and female. 
how do you morph over to um, God being father, mother versus some people worshiping Jesus as God? That's been a, a conflict of me to how to, it is so logical, the Christian science, but how to um, impart that to others who might believe Jesus is God and, and God is only a man. Sure. Uh, honestly, uh, I'll have to say that that I I tried to stay away from that in the beginning. Mm -hmm. and I would only get into that when I started to see there was some receptivity to Christian science, because yeah. that that will immediately turn people away. I if, I hear you. If yeah. you start, if you say no, Jesus is not God. You you like most of the room is going to turn around and walk away. And and so and, and a lot of people think of the devil as real too. So um, I know I know. You know what I did on on um, on the devil and you know hell and all that stuff. I actually there are some good books out there written on the history of where the myth of hell and the myth of the devil and the myth of the fallen angel, all that stuff. You know, there's a his, there's a history of that, and it started with the pagan religions, and it sort of filtered into Judaism and then from Judaism into Christianity. And so I found some good books on that and I would share that. And I'd say, this, this stuff's not real. And here's the proof. It's history. It's not my religion telling you this. These are historians, Christian yeah. and religious historians that are saying this stuff is not real. And when they would read that, they'd be like, wow. I mean, it wasn't me just saying, no, it's not real. Mm -hmm. I, I was providing them some good um, historic um, narratives, you know, about how all that happened. And and also, you know, that uh, in the, well, it's in the King James, James Bible, Bible where Jesus talks about the goats and the sheep, you know, some are going to go to hell and some are not. And, but even that, was a mistranslation from the original um, Greek that was then translated into Latin and then from Latin into English. And so I found uh, a Greek translation that basically showed that that's not what Jesus said. And and so that I would I would bring some of that into my um, I don't know if you want to call it class, but. I would bring some of that stuff with me because I didn't want to just say, no, that's not true, or I don't believe that. I would say, look, these are the experts. These are historians and scholars. You know, they it's not real. It's not true. And so that that was one way I sort of dealt with that that stuff. Thank you. That's a good point. But the uh the whole Jesus is God thing, I, I really I held off on that until you know people were really starting to dig into Christian science and they're starting to understand Christian science and then we could have those conversations. Well, son of God and I and my father are one. We got that logic we can work in. Right, right. But I've been I've been I found out early on for every Bible verse I would give, they'd have another one. You know, and and so that just turns into a debate. So mm -hmm. um, it, thank it's, you. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's my experience. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Lynette, you have to unmute. Yep, you did. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, absolutely. Um, I can hear you, Lynette. I'm on my phone and I don't know. It's the first time I've done this on the phone. I don't know how to get my video going. I have to go into settings. So anyway, I wondered um, if, if anybody could speak to um, the fact that do you... Um, there's the statistic that there's a disproportionate amount of African American men and women uh, in the prison system. You know, it's called mass incarceration. And um, if you have helped address race issues, I mean, we can all go and say, well, we're all, you know, we're all the children of God and, um, you know, uh, we're spiritual, so our skin color doesn't matter. And But they have had experiences of, you know, race-related experiences. And if you have addressed that or been able to do that in a successful way, 
um, because they can be subtle and they can be blatant, the experiences that they've had. So I wondered if you have addressed that in any way. Um, you know, it came up, but not in a in not in a way. Um, it it would it would just come up. Um, I'm going to say the best way to say it. Uh, the first thing I did is that I just approached that in terms of I I wanted to listen to them. Yes, I wanted to hear where they're coming from, and you know I heard all those same experiences that you've probably heard, and and um, so it's interesting. I ended up spending some time talking about um, Martin Luther King and how Martin Luther King uh, was following Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount and loving your enemies. And so I really incorporated, you know, the, the, the nonviolent, you know, strategy that was in the civil rights movement. And of course it was in India with Gandhi. And, um, but it was an interesting connection I made. So, um, and, and if you've got a few moments, um, I, I was a Russian studies major in college and, and I studied um, Leo Tolstoy. And at the end of Leo Tolstoy's life, he started writing about Christianity. And one of the things he started writing about was uh, nonviolence based on the Sermon on the Mount and based on Jesus Christ. And uh, Mary Baker Eddy's Science and Health ended up in his uh, library and he studied it. And I've seen it myself when I was in Moscow. I've seen Science and Health in his library. But he then became a, uh, a pen pal with Gandhi and he was telling Gandhi about how he needed to incorporate the teachings of Jesus Christ in his non in his political movement and of course Martin Luther King was basing his movement on Gandhi but it was all based on the Sermon on the Mount it was all based on loving your enemy and so we would talk about some of that stuff but the bottom line is we were talking about loving your enemies and talking about how Jesus loved his enemies and of course he was put on a cross he was innocent you know like a lot of the experiences they've had where they're innocent, but they're being treated, you know, uh, in an unjust way. Well, how did Jesus deal with it? Well, that's how we deal with it. And that's how they can deal with it. And they really embraced that. Um, and, and it helped them. Uh, one guy in particular, I was talking about at the beginning that said he was so angry and he hated people. And he wanted to fight. Well, a lot of that was, he was he was an African American. He was pretty angry, but you know, over the period of time that we would meet, I saw him become that meek, you know, person with those Christ-like qualities, and a lot of that was working on loving our enemies and the Sermon on the Mount, and I saw him transform. And um, I remember at the beginning he was a little bit cool to me you know because i'm white and he's black but in the end you know we we're hugging one another and you know we'd say we love you. one i love you man and you know i mean it was it just it just melted and it all melted really because of what what jesus taught and of course mrs eddie has a whole article on love your enemies and so it's easy to incorporate some of the things that she said about that and and i think that just that just melts away a lot of those those kinds of issues. Anybody else? We're a little over our time, but I think it's been uh, pretty good, George. Pretty good. Better than decent. How's that? <laughs> Well, I, I really enjoyed it. You know, it's at any time <laughs> to to share the blessings that come from the prison or the jail ministry, you know, sign me up anytime. You know, I yeah, I love talking about it and sharing it. Good. I'll be back to you. <laughs> yeah, and I'll just say I really appreciated hearing your <clears throat> your insights about the growth 
uh, that this represents inside of the movement as far as actual like kind of tangible ways to express these ideas and help help put them into practice. So thank you so much, George. Uh, this was an outstanding interview. Thank you, David. I'm glad you got your video sorted out. You're welcome, um, David Gabriel. And thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, really love hearing these stories and examples of kind of how 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 we can do this stuff. And it's just very useful. I'm going to paste again into the chat uh, the link to the conference information. George, I, I hope we might see you there in Dallas. Maybe. I think the, the day 